Hello and welcome once again to Matthew's Haunted Reviews. You know, Scooby-Doo and the gang have had a long history of capturing mass criminals and their mystery-solving exploits. And with the overwhelming success of reruns on Cartoon Network, I guess Hanna-Barbera wanted to try mixing things up a bit in order to revive the franchise, but without repeating the travesty that was certain ghosts of Scooby-Doo. Let's get him, Bogle! I'm with you, weird! So, how do they plan to do that exactly? By making direct-to-DVD movies instead of a new show, of course. Not that that sort of thing went over so well in the past, but I guess there are some things that are worth risking if you know what you're doing. And Warner Brothers, who obtained the rights to make the direct-to-DVD movies, knew exactly what they were doing. And needless to say, this plan ultimately went off without a hitch, and even the horrible live-action film as well as these DVDs would lead to new TV shows, which would eventually lead to the amazingness that is Mystery Incorporated. But that's a story for another time. I've covered my favorite of these movies already, but I think it's high time I covered the first one, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. And I think you know what time that means it is. Hit the intro, story writer. It was a dark and stormy night as Hanna-Barbera and Warner Brothers presents text came with a flash of lightning and vanished the same way, only for a castle near a body of water to take its place. The opening credits appear and vanish, the camera dramatically moves about the castle, and we eventually see a monster tear open a door, revealing our heroes inside it. They split up as they make a break for it, Shaggy oddly not going the same way as Scooby as he quadruple locks the door behind him. He tries the other door, but the monster was there waiting for him. How oddly polite. Forgetting he locked the other door, he breaks the doorknob and runs around the monster, running as, as the theme song starts and the chase continues. It's a definitely rocking version of the song by Third Eye Blind. There's even a bit of the classic Scooby Doors trope, subverted by the fact that the monster doesn't even try to chase them through the doors. Eventually, through the usual intricate slip-up, the monster is apprehended and unmanned. <gasps> Look! It's Mr. Beeman, the real estate agent! Mr. Beeman? Yeah! He was printing millions of counterfeit dollars in the basement with his printing press. What we originally thought was mold was really green ink! See? <laughs> And I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for that big dog and you meddling kids! Ah, oh, he said the line. Always a classic. We didn't cut to a few months or years or so later, where Daphne is on a touch. Stories like that always give me the heebie-jeebies! No wonder you became a reporter! Wait, what? That moat monster almost sliced you up like a pepperoni pizza! And then we wouldn't have Coast to Coast with Daphne Blake! 
your very successful syndicated series on Americana. Going on its second season, I might add. I never miss it. Thanks, Chris. You know, the real reason I changed jobs was because the monsters and ghosts always turned out to be bad guys in a mask. Got a little boring, eh? <laughs> no kidding. In fact, that's why the gang went their separate ways, except for Fred and me. Wait, what? Well... I suppose it could be worse. They could have had a falling out, and he later intentionally reunited in body and spirit by eventual Scrappy-Doo, who invited him to a haunted thick part. Oh, wait. So, what's coming up for the new season? A new series of segments called Haunted America. Sort of a ghost to ghost with Daphne Blake. Oh, ha ha ha. It's funny because of Space Ghost. Not. He didn't cut to Scooby-Doo and Shaggy. At an airport. Excuse me for a moment. Why did that crappy live action movie borrow this part from that movie so I had to be reminded of it while watching a significantly better movie? Anyway, Shaggy's swole as a bomb sniffer goes about as well as you'd expect. Pretty sneaky. But they can't fool your nose. That's right. Like, no one brings contraband food into our country with us on the job. Well... Like, let's go check it in, Scoob. You know, I'm surprised all that food is even still there with those two around. Meanwhile, Thelma is working at a bookstore, getting an order for a series of books that doubtlessly causes nostalgia. I just sure as hell isn't how, by the fact that, like Shaggy and Scooby, she has turned into Daphne's interview. Thankfully, Fred calls her and invites her to join him and Daphne on their next episode. We go back to Shaggy and Scooby, and even though it's now gone, I still stand by the fact that it's strange that it took them so long to eat all of that food. Their boss isn't too happy about this, though. Oh, there's still a couple of Gorgonzolas left. Help yourself! You're a couple of Gorgonzolas! Real mature boss to have there with an insult like that one. Busy? Nah. Scoob and I were just thinking of taking some time off. Stop reminding me of that movie! Fred brings the mystery machine around as the couple prepare to roll out, but he surprises Daphne with the rest of the gang. Eventually, the gang sets out for New Orleans, solving some mysteries along the way to the tune of the very awesome song, The Ghost Is Here, although the lyrics could do without the complaining about great ghosts and all that. Daphne complains a bit, and we're introduced to Lena, who's a chef at Moonscar Island, which she claims is haunted by a pirate ghost, Captain Morgan Moonscar. Not to be confused with Captain Morgan. What is it with pirate ghosts, anyway? Hey, pirates, no one likes the light ghost. I'm not saying it's more than a coincidence, but come on, that's two for two now with Scooby-Doo and that comic. And the first one wasn't even a horror trope. Anyway, the gang are naturally skeptical about there being a real ghost on the island. Well, what do you think? What do we have to lose? It's the best lead we've had all day. And that Lena is kind of cute. Fred! I just meant she'd be real photogenic for our segment. And this is exactly why they'll never get married. <coughs> Wait, did I say something? Velma looks up Moonscar Island and discovers that there's been strange disappearances over the years. Fred wonders where Shoogie and Shaggy are, but of course... Where'd those guys go? Oh, that's no mystery. Where else? To get a bite to eat. Hey, that's my job. Anyway, sure enough, the two are ordering their typical giant sandwich, though this one is particularly spicy. Like mo hotter, mo better, eh, Scoob? Oh, my god, why? Eventually, the gang makes their way to Lena's boat, and we're introduced to Jack, who has a slightly out-of-place accent. <laughs> if they want haunted, they come to the right place. Well, gee, that's not suspicious at all. We then learned that the pirates used to buy you the hide bounty, including Moonscar himself. We're also introduced to a notorious catfish known as Big Mona, who no one's ever been able to catch. Like most non-dog animals, she doesn't get along well with Scooby. 
Her antics even nearly lead Shaggy and Scooby to get eaten by a pair of gators, doubtlessly the same ones who were put out of work during the events of the rescuers. Wait, wrong animation company. Shaggy and Scooby are then saved by a rather mean-looking incarnation of Bayou Billy. Power. He gets awful indigestion for meeting strangers. <laughs> Keeps me up all night. Okay, maybe not, but there are some uncanny if not loose parallels to that episode within this movie. Like the fact that it centers around Billy helping Kevin find his dog. Weird. The Fisher and Snake Bite Scruggs unsurprisingly get rid of Shaggy and Scooby for causing Big Mona to get away. After Jack and Scruggs have a rather unfriendly exchange, we're also introduced to Scruggs' hunting boy, Mojo. He's referred to as a pig, but he's obviously an improperly tamed boar, who like Jack is clearly not native to the area. Though, to Jack's credit, I suppose that his accent and dialect are a bit of a hybrid to the reasons I'll get to a bit later. Also, Scruggs is an all-too-obvious red herring. Eventually, the gang arrive at the mansion, where they'll be staying to investigate, driving by the gardener, Bill Neville, on their way. Unfortunately, the place also happens to be crawling with cats, and Scooby's canine instincts kicked in. What? Oh, come back, Scoob! Hey, you mutt! I just planted those! Rats! Did that cat just... no, never mind, it's probably nothing. Whoa! Well, excuse me! Well, I really have to feel sorry for that guy right now. Scooby eventually literally runs into the proprietor of the state, Simone Lenore, who also seems distinctly foreign, like Italian or something. Simone raises an objection to Daphne hosting her show on her property. After Daphne tries to convince her, Fred asks how old the place is, and Simone exposits that it's been around for generations. It used to be a chili pepper plantation, much to Sarah Gaines Scooby's delight. Then, then suddenly she has a slight change of heart for no reason at all, on the condition that they keep Scooby from chasing the cats. Shaggy pointing out that food keeps him occupied, which I bet is just a way to get more food. Simone doesn't know them very well, however, so she agrees to let them in their kitchen, where Shaggy and Scooby try some gumbo. But they think it's not spicy enough and grab some peppers from a pantry, causing the others to think that they were in trouble. That was some hot pepper. <laughs> Those are Moon Sky Island peppers. I wasn't exaggerating when I said they were the hottest peppers in Louisiana. I can personally say that she really wasn't. They're definitely to die for. The others leave to explore the place and Shaggy and their Scooby to eat a pepper, only to feel a cold breeze. An icy cold breeze. And they see Ghost Rider. Or maybe not. The others arrive and see the writing too. And Daphne starts recording, only for evil Ghost Rider to return. Shortly after amending its warning, it starts levitating Velma with no signs of tricks of any sort like there usually are. Velma and Daphne have very different reactions to this. Fred and Velma examine the footage Fred got, and with the purely fictional powers of Zoom and Hans, they see the ghost of Captain Moonscar. Simone questions Daphne's enthusiasm, but she says that they're not afraid. Though naturally Shaggy and Scooby think otherwise and head off to pack some food cause they're out of here. Velma goes to the kitchen as well and examines the wall. Noticing how easily the rain chips off and finds a logo under it. She then discovers the logo has the name of Moon Scar Ship. Simone reasoning that parts of the ship could have been used to build the place, saying that Moon Scar buried treasure on the island that no one has found. Naturally, this leads Fred to reason that someone is disguised as a pirate ghost to scare people off and steal the treasure. Simone, Lena, and Daphne are not convinced, however. 
Meanwhile, Shaggy and Scooby are picnicking for some reason and take the hot pepper challenge. The challenge is to not scream. Unfortunately, some of the cats decided to eat some of their potato salad or whatever. Scooby again giving chase, getting his head stuck in a log, and then Mr. J. Frog's stomach after he pulls it out of the log. The cat's laughing at his plight the whole time. Eventually, he winds up scaring away Big Mona again, which naturally leads to Mojo being sicked on him, and Shaggy also eventually joins in on the running, only for them to land in one of Team Rocket's many pitfall traps. Shaggy grabs a vine, but it comes loose, revealing a skeleton which is reanimated to a zombie by mystical energies. Doubtlessly, these energies also compensating for the rigor mortis, I'd imagine. They escape and literally run into Bo, and uh, it looks like the zombie is gone for now. After some conversing, they notice the sun is setting and the ferry doesn't run at night, so Simone invites them over to sleep over at her place. Oh, I couldn't let you leave without offering some of our famous southern hospitality. After they're shown to their rooms, we get a visual gag on Shaggy's limited wardrobe and we get an Al Who joke. These things are seriously starting to wear on me. At least he didn't drag it on, instead opting for some visual humor. Whoa! Dude, that's creepy. As Shaggy is admiring his goatee in a mirror, a ghost soldier in a very old uniform appears inside of it and they run away. Simone showing very clear and unmistakable dislike for Scooby. Velma examines the back of the mirror, and we learn that the mirror most likely belonged to the soldier we just saw, and Simone mentions that there were Confederate barracks on the island. Like ghost pirates, ghost soldiers, what's next? Would you people stop stealing my lines? Anyway, apparently dinner is next. Simone forces Scooby to eat in the kitchen, and Shaggy joins him. More food visual humor with Shaggy and Scooby. Yay. Or more Scooby chasing cats, which causes Scooby to force the E outside, but Lena is a bit more lenient and gives him a pot of boiled crawfish and a plate of biscuits as they eat inside the mystery machine instead. And now we get the food visual humor. Ugh. The cats crowd around the van, probably because of the seafood, so they drive off shaking the cats off the roof. Wow. That's kind of rude and dangerous for the cats. Back at the mansion, Velma and Fred come up with a bunch of different theories on the basis that it's all just a hoax of some sort. Really, guys? For once, can't you accept that maybe there are some mysteries that have no rational explanation? Stop stealing my lines. After some more food humor that involves them eating another pair of raw peppers, causing them to drink out of the bayou. Ew! Er, the spectral energies return and zombies appear out of the water! They try to escape, but to get the mystery machine stuck in the mud so they have to run on foot, only to literally run into Bo again. Obvious red herring is still obvious. Fred hears Shaggy and Scooby screaming and grabs his camera, and Lena gets him, Velma, and Daphne some lantern. They run into obvious red herring suspect number one and interrogate him. But Daphne has her priorities in the correct order, so they split up. Velma goes with Bo because she doesn't trust him and doesn't trust Daphne with him for reasons I'll get to later on. And Daphne and Fred go another way. Bo gets angry for Velma treating him like a suspect and throws a rock at her. 
revealing quicksand which Velma nearly walked into, which was the actual target. Daphne finds their van and gets spooked by the empty crawdutch. Really? Spooked by the crawdutch? What? Fred looks around a van. Daphne judo throws a z wait. What the hell? I guess she took self-defense classes so she didn't ever have to be a DID damseling the stress or something. I mean, she's danger-prone Daphne after all. Shaggy appears and then she accidentally judo throws him and Scooby naturally shows up as well. The two totally not lovebirds go for the unmasking, but that goes as well as you might expect at this point. After a game of hot potato, the zombie reattaches his head. Head on. Apply directly to the forehead. Head on. Apply directly to the forehead. Head on. Apply directly to the forehead. A Pokemon seems to have used ominous wind as more spirit energy strikes the water again. However, that's not the only part of the bay where zombies are rising. Fred and Daphne break a break for it. Fred loses his camera in quicksand, and a chase sequence ensues to the tune of the ever-awesome It's Terror Time Again, which you may have heard earlier in my seasonal intro. Like the Ghost is Here, it's written by Glenn Lev Leopold, and is performed by Sky Cycle. Sky Cycle, really? Fred and Daphne reunited with Velma and Bew, Shaggy and Scooby stumble down a cave and find them voodoo dolls of the gang, Shan, Shaggy, and Scooby, and we learn that this is how the levitation happened. But they're scared off by a bunch of red eyes, which turn out to be vampire bats. Chili, Shaggy, and Scooby, vampire bats don't drink human blood. You two could stand to listen to Velma more often. <sighs> it was just a bunch of bats, Scoob. Eh, never mind. Back at the mansion, Fred falls through the staircase. Boy, is that thing not up to code. Actually, it's a secret passageway, which Lena claims was built during the Civil War era to hide from Union soldiers. But considering the markings on the staircase, these are clearly mystic runes. It's pretty obvious she's either wrong or lying. Lena also claims that zombies dragged Simone away, which gets Velma suspicious that there's no sign of this, only footprints. And they come to a strange room, which Velma says looks like a place where voodoo rituals take place, and immediately casts suspicion on Lena. Simone then confirmed her suspicions. Hey, Velma, if you knew all along, why did you let her lead you into a trap? Also in the category of questions that need answers, where did she get the voodoo dolls from if they were not in the same location? I mean, I know Shaggy and Scooby fell down a hole pretty far away, and I know that this is a cave system, but I'm pretty sure this isn't the same spot. Bo shows up, but it turns out that they had a voodoo doll of him as well. Velma says the classic, you won't get away with this line, which Simone replies that she's been getting away with it for over 200 years. Wait, so not I already have? Hmm, interesting. She and Lena then transform into freaky, careless cat people. Simone then explains that every harvest moon they have to drain the life force from the victims lured to their island to preserve their immortality. I could make a tourist trap joke here, but it'd be way too easy. Also, as Shaggy and Scooby quickly learn, naturally Jack was in on it too as he turns into a proper werecat. This probably would explain his dual accent and speech mannerisms as he's had plenty of time to develop a Louisiana flair. I mean, if he was there for so long, he probably was from France. Simone then has a flashback explaining that she was with a group of settlers inhabiting the island who worshipped a cat god. Sounds very historically inaccurate. Are there pagan cat gods or something? I, I, don't, I don't get it. 
Moonstar and his crew came to bury his treasure, however, and raided the settlement, driving the locals into the bayou and letting the gators feed on them for some reason instead of just outright killing them. Except Lena and Simone, who were the only ones that had somehow managed to get away. Plot contrivances. I were wondering where these were going to rear their ugly head. I mean, I could buy all this stuff earlier on in the movie, but this? Not so much. They prayed for a curse on the pirates that turned into the werecat monsters instead, and killed the pirates. Wow, even if it was off screen, that was kind of dark. I love a show that doesn't dumb itself down for the audience. We didn't get a flashback to the spice traders who built the plantation, also victims of the werecat. And Aphne then works out that the zombies were all of their victims, and that they were just trying to warn the gang. Speaking of that, the zombies pile on Jack, saving Shaggy and Scooby so they can run away, and then they literally stumble upon... Wait, that can't be the same cave as before. Ugh, minor detail. Simone gets really ticked off by them showing up, and she and Lena go full werecat. They do run away, but accidentally knock the voodoo dolls near a fire, causing the game to start... Okay, I know I like a show that doesn't dumb itself down, but that's just plain creepy. Planks will lead the two run back from the other direction, knocking the dolls away, allowing Velma to undo the bindings on hers with her feet. Okay. However, one of the tourist zombies shows up and walks right past them. Wow, that's just rude. If you don't want them to suffer the same fate, offer them some help. I mean, there's plenty of other zombies to attack Luna and Simone after all. Speaking of which, a pair of confederate zombies attacked him, causing Shaggy and Scooby to get flung up through a hole in the underground roof. Thankfully, a singular zombie breaks their fall. The two, for some odd reason, aren't convinced yet that the zombies are good guys, however, and wind up getting caught by Jock again. They manage to break free and squirt a check of pepper in his eyes. Shaggy had put some in his pocket earlier. You'd be surprised by a large amount of seemingly minor details that are starting to become important. Unfortunately, Shaggy and Scooby are caught by Lena and Simone, who start draining them, only for them to get hung backwards by a pair of voodoo dolls. Wait, where'd they get the magic wax from? Anyway, the two get flung around while Shaggy and Scooby return to normal, but a blinded Jack stumbles into the girls, causing them to drop the dolls and the three resume their attack. Thankfully, however, midnight has conveniently already passed, and they start to feel the full effect of the curse and the... Okay, I know I used this clip earlier in a completely different context, but, uh... Dude, that's creepy. The leader of the Confederates sank the gang, and Bo reveals that what I'm sure is some of you already knew all along, he is a detective. Fred and Daphne share a romantic moment, but they're not the only ones who have a moment. Bayou casts a spell all its own, and no matter how hard you try to solve its mysteries, it always keeps something hidden. Oh, that was beautiful, Detective Neville. There's a bit of a poet in you. <laughs> I don't know about that, ma'am. But I would like to write detective stories someday. Jinkies! I've always been crazy about a good detective. A story, that is. I even own my own mystery bookstore. No kidding. Shaggy drives up in the van and says that Scooby is... He's picking a peck of peppers for the road! Yeah, that. 
The boat starts pulling out and Scooby barely manages to make it or ends up scaring off the Mona again, whom Scruggs had actually managed to catch this time. Scooby tries to eat a sandwich, but he seems that there are a few stowaways and we end on Rocky Rats Rikes. Uh, wait, what? You're supposed to end on him saying, Scooby Dooby Doo, I call foul. Okay, so they saved it for the stinger, but really, that's just not right still. Many people stop watching movies as soon as the credits start rolling, even if they have heard of stingers before. And one more thing I want to address, because I didn't bring much attention to it earlier, is that Fred and Daphne were pining over Lena and Boo, respectively, even though they were a couple. Obviously, this didn't last past the end of the movie, but this would kind of become a thing between these two and future movies and shows. Anyway, I guess I give Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island an 8.5 out of 10 in my seal of approval. Until next time, stay spooked.